Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Gender Libertarian Podcast. If you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, and on Libertarian Institute. This has been an incredibly long, full, awful, horrible, no good week for news and covering news cycles. But here we are again at the end of another week, and I've already done two episodes this week, starting with the events that started last weekend with the mass shootings. I did a whole episode on the El Paso shooting and the manifesto, and then the last episode that I did, I talked about the Dayton shooting, I talked about a lot of the public reactions, media reactions to both of the shootings, and so those are there if you want to go listen to those. Of course, I encourage you to do that. But in the last episode, I did touch on the idea of red flag laws, and I said that I would discuss it a little more in this episode, so that's where I want to start before we move on to the suicide herd around the world, because of course nobody can record anything right now without discussing the Epstein suicide, but I do want to go back and start with the red flag laws, and there's two concepts out there right now that I kind of want to separate and discuss separately, and that is the idea of a red flag law. And also the idea of adding one's mental health history to the federal database that if you ever purchase a gun, and if, you, if you're if you not familiar with this, let me just walk you through it real quick. When you go to purchase a gun, whether you buy it from a gun, a gun show, you buy it from a, a dealer, like you go to a gun shop, if you go to say like Dick's Sporting Goods, well actually no, because they don't even sell handguns anymore, but any place that sells handguns, like Bass Pro Shops I know sells handguns, but like any place like that. And what happens is you go, you say, yes, I want to purchase this gun. And then you fill out this form and then they punch it into a computer. And what happens is it sent a query to a federal database where every state is supposed to report your criminal history into this federal database, whether you've ever been charged with a felony, anything like that. And then you the, the query gets sent to the database. It kicks back. Either you're good to go or no, this person can't have a gun. I've seen people starting to discuss again, and this is something that always comes up every time a mass shooting happens. And I can actually remember discussing this like in one of the first episodes that I ever made for my podcast. And I'm like, we're here again. Like we're having this discussion again. But people want to add one's mental health history to the the kind of file that you have in the federal database alongside like your criminal record. And so those are two separate ideas that they they go together in the fact that they both deal with mental health issues, but I do think that they're getting kind of lumped in together and that they do need to be discussed separately because one to me is a lot more worrisome than the other. They're both worrisome, do not get me wrong. But I want to start with the idea of adding your mental health history to that federal database. The first thing that I thought when I saw this idea is that is going to be a huge, massive, glaring HIPAA violation. And what HIPAA is, is it's the suite of laws that basically protects your your health history overall, not just mental health, but you know, your your physical health, all of the the things that you go to your doctor for, you go to the hospital, whatever. There's very specific protocol as to who can and cannot have access to that information and how that information has to be handled. And it's basically to preserve doctor patient confidentiality and that it is not public knowledge if you're receiving treatment for say AIDS or cancer or any other kind of like STD, or if you are currently in therapy for depression or anxiety, or even something more serious than that, if you're dealing with, say, manic depressiveness or schizophrenia or ADHD or or just anything, like basically anything, it's all considered to be private information and it is only accessible to people outside of specific people in the healthcare industry. Like obviously your doctor has access to this, your insurance provider, the clearinghouse that that information goes through between your doctor and your insurance provider, but it's not available to just anybody. And the only other people that can have access to this information is say, if you are in, if you're like in court, and it's deemed relevant, like, but you, that's a really, really high bar to meet. So the whole point of HIPAA is that it keeps your private information private. So 
here's the thing. If you add mental health to the database, then obviously now you have people outside of the healthcare industry and outside of your personal healthcare chain who would have access to your medical information. I mean, there's uh, the people that work at, you know, gun shops and stuff like that. I'm not sure when it kicks the query back, if it really gives like detailed information, but it's still like a yes or no sort of thing. And it's just, it's something that it has been kind of decided and determined both through law and through just like general consensus that the federal government does not and should not have access to your private health care. Like what goes on in your private health care is supposed to be your business. This would be making it the federal government's business. And let's just say the federal government is not super good at keeping private information private. So it's not something that I think people should be entrusting to the federal government. And I could just see so many ways in which this is going to go wrong and just horrible and bad and awful and no good. But kind of moving broader sort of concept. If it becomes a situation where, say, you now know that if you go to seek treatment for whatever mental health issue that you have, that all of a sudden you're going to be in this federal database, that is going to discourage people from seeking mental health assistance. And this is something that really, really needs to be discussed and really weigh out the pros and cons of this because there has been so much work put in over the decades to destigmatize the idea of mental health and of receiving help for mental health. And it's just, I'm not okay with anything that's going to possibly roll that back. It just, it just, it, no, no, it's none of the federal government's business. And I'm not down with anybody being disincentivized to receive mental health care because they think that their second amendment rights are going to be taken away from them. And that's not to say that like every person that receives mental health treatment is some kind of crazy wackadoo who's going to go commit a mass shooting. Like there's millions and millions and millions of people right now who are in treatment, who are on medication and and they're fine. And like, those are the people that you really don't have to worry about. Like the people that have identified they have a problem and are seeking help. Those are the ones that I don't worry about. It's the ones that aren't seeking help. And putting somebody's mental health into that database and, and conjoining that with your criminal history is not going to help those who are not seeking mental health assistance. Like, those are the crazy people. Those are the crazy people you need to worry about. And before you think that I'm, like, exaggerating on this, I remember when I first talked about this, God, over a year ago, it was in the vein of discussing the fact that there are states, I think California actually did end up doing it, where they were passing laws that said that if you had a medicinal marijuana license, if you if you could buy it legally, then you couldn't own a gun. Like, <laughs> it's shit like that. It's like stuff like that that you have to worry about because people will misuse this shit. And I'm not okay with somebody who, okay, they have a mental health record because they're they're in therapy for whatever. They have depression. They have PTSD. They have this. They have that. They have whatever. But they're fine. They're fine. Like, they're, they're under control. It's being handled. But then if they decide to go buy a gun, all of a sudden the database is going to kick it back and be like, nope, you can't have that. And nobody seems to really be articulating like what would and would not be put into the database as far as like how far down this hill do you go? Like it, it's easy to define at the edges who should and should not have a gun based on mental health reasons. Like if somebody's, if somebody's like a paranoid schizophrenic, like, okay, that, that person probably shouldn't have a gun. But what if somebody's just depressed? Like, should that person have a gun? What about somebody who is bipolar? Should that person have a gun? Like, where, where does it stop? And that's why I worry about these sorts of things, because you can, you can see, like, the edges. Like, the edges are pretty clearly defined, but the closer you get to the middle, the more blurry and fuzzy it gets. And nobody's really defining, like, 
where's the line? Like, who's who's going to be on this side of the line? Who's going to be on that side of the line? And are you going to be like taking the constitutional rights away from people who have done nothing to deserve having their rights taken away? Like, for whatever, however you feel about this, the Second Amendment exists. And to deprive somebody of their Second Amendment rights is a big deal. Like, you should have done something to merit that. And just seeking help for a mental health issue that you have should not be one of the things that should disqualify you from being able to own a weapon if you wish. And for reasons I've already laid out, this could disenfranchise millions upon millions of people and not stop a single mass shooting at all. Like none. Because again, the obvious way to get around that is just don't seek mental health and then it's not on your record. And poof, there you go. Just the same way that Every one of these mass shooters, like, I cannot remember the last time I saw a mass shooter get their guns illegally. Like, they all passed background checks. They didn't have felonies on their records. And so, obviously, the easiest way to get around that if you're crazy is just don't seek help for your crazy, and then poof! Fucking gun! Woo! Like, it's just, it's dumb, and it's just, it's going to hurt so many people, and I just, I don't see where it's going to stop anything. And... A theoretical that I want to post before we kind of move on from this to the red flag laws is the what if. Let's say the El Paso shooter obviously has a horrific ideology and just stuff that should be rejected out of hand, but say he passes a psych eval. I mean, being a crazy racist wackadoo who probably watches too much Fox News and believes everything that comes out of the president's mouth is not in the DSM-5. So if somebody has horrific views, but is not mentally ill, uh, because I mean, that's a clinical diagnosis. Like it's not, it's one thing to say somebody's crazy. I mean, okay, that dude's crazy. Is he mentally ill? I don't know. But what happens if he's not? Then what? So then what's going to be the criteria for keeping the guns out of those people's hands? I mean, it's uh, where, where, again, where does that hill stop? Like it's, again, it's one of those that's easy to define at the far edges, but the closer you get into the center, the fuzzier things get. And so does that then move from, okay, if this guy's a mass shooter, he has horrible ideology, he's not clinically mentally ill, then what's the next criteria? Like, is it just having horrific ideology? Like, okay, sure. Sure. We can say white supremacy is a horrific ideology, which it is. But then where does that stop? Like, where is that edge? Where's that line? And if that's going to be the next like spot where if all of a sudden checking somebody's criminal background doesn't work and then checking somebody's mental health background doesn't work, what is, is it going to be evaluating people's social media posts to make sure that they're not saying like crazy shit? And what's going to constitute crazy shit? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of things that a lot of us have posted on social media that would constitute two people outside of this movement as crazy shit. Like, if you post things on social media about abolishing the state, somebody's going to consider that crazy shit. And then what happens when they show up on your doorstep and said, okay, well, so-and-so, you made all these Facebook posts, and so we've determined that your ideology is not up to snuff with you having weapons, so I'm going to need you to hand over them guns. No, you're not going to hand over them guns. Those are mine. And the Second Amendment says I don't have to. But that's what I mean when these these sorts of arguments get brought up. And it sounds good in your head until you start thinking about it. And you start thinking towards like the logical end game of these. And then it starts becoming more and more horrifying. So it's like you got to stop and think before you start infringing upon people's rights that the thing that you're trying to do makes sense, first and foremost, and isn't going to stomp on a whole bunch of other people's rights in the process, because those people don't deserve that. Like, they did nothing wrong. So why should why should their guns be taken away? Why should their rights be taken away? Because of some other fucking lunatic who did a thing. Like, that's just conflating things together that don't belong together. And to sum it up, not all people who have mental health issues are crazy, lunatic, mass shooters in waiting. Everybody, for the most part, is somewhat well-adjusted, especially the people who are seeking help because you know you have a problem, and so you're working on the problem. Like, 
you're doing it right. Like, you're doing good. I don't want you to lose your rights because you figured out that you have a problem and that you're seeking treatment for your problem. Like, that's that's it. That's where that is. And so that's why I have such a problem with this idea of tying mental health to gun ownership. But moving on from that to red flag laws, because this is it's the same, but it's a little bit different. So this is how red flag laws work. And as it stands right now, there's a handful of states that do have these laws. The vast majority of states do not have these laws on the books. And I forget, I, I want to say it's like 10 states have red flag laws. And so how it works is this. If you're in that state and you have, say, you have a family member or you have, if you're a mental health provider and you have a patient and you feel like that person is going to be a threat to either themselves or to other people, what you do is you go before the court, you go before a judge and you present your evidence that you feel like this person based on XYZ evidence is posing an imminent threat to themselves or to others. And then a judge hands down a decision that says, okay, you can take away this person's guns for X amount of time, X amount of time being dependent upon the state's laws. So that is how red flag laws work. Now, the constitutionality of that is a little fuzzy. Like, I don't know if there's any current cases right now pending based around red flag laws and the constitutionality of them. The only way I can see really getting around it is that they are state laws and not federal laws. And we'll get to that in a second. But again, that's, it's one of it. I, here's, here's my thing with red flag laws. They are state laws and states do have the right to set their own laws on guns based on just what they want to do. That's states' rights. I kind of have to respect that. Like, I don't really agree with red flag laws, but it is every state's right to institute them if that is the will of the people of that state. So, again, this is one of those things where I can say that a state has the absolute right to make a red flag law if they so wish. Doesn't necessarily mean I have to agree with it, but it is their right. So, that is where those are. And like I said, there's only a handful of states that have them, but what this conversation is on a federal level because obviously Congress cannot pass a national red flag law because of the Second Amendment that specifically says that Congress can't do that. The idea is that Congress would pass a bill encouraging states to pass red flag laws, which to me just seems kind of stupid and a waste of time. Like, okay, it's not going to mandate that states make red flag laws because again, Congress can't do that. And so anything outside of that, it's like, okay, cool. Nice nice to know that you guys are on board with states making red flag laws. Like, I don't understand what the purpose of this is supposed to be. Like, okay, like, uh, fine. <laughs> okay. I mean, you can't really force it on states. But the, the idea of red flag laws becoming more prevalent is something to keep an eye on. Because like I said, you can, you can agree that a state can do it. Doesn't necessarily make it 100% kosher. And also, obviously, within that framework of red flag laws, there is potential for abuse because, I mean, you could uh, gin up an excuse to take away somebody's guns. And again, you are infringing upon somebody's constitutional rights based on that person not having committed a crime yet. And yes, before you, before anybody says anything, I get it. I don't like that you have to wait for somebody to either hurt themselves or somebody else before you can do something about it. But legally speaking, depriving somebody of their rights when they haven't done anything wrong is pretty fucked up. Like, even if you think that some that somebody is going to hurt themselves, maybe they won't. And like, depriving somebody of their Second Amendment rights on a maybe is really like squishy for me. And like, I, it's one of those where I get... I, I get where the sentiment is on it. I get where people are at emotionally on it. And I understand that the idea of red flag laws is to try to prevent mass shootings or just any kinds of shootings, whether it be hurting that person hurting themselves or hurting members of their family or not. I mean, not even taking it to the extreme where they like drive 10 hours to a Walmart and kill 29 people, but just trying to keep somebody from hurting themselves. Like I get it. Emotionally, I understand where it's coming from. 
Legally, I'm not entirely sure if that is 100% kosher. So the idea of Congress promoting red flag laws is kind of stupid and ridiculous to me because, again, it's not their purview. Like, the Ninth Amendment is pretty fucking clear on this, that it's not their place to really say anything about it. So, yeah. I get, I pass the bill, don't pass the bill. It really doesn't make a big fucking difference, but there you go. That's where we are with red flag laws and also adding mental health to the federal database. So, moving on to the Epstein suicide. Now, in talking about this, I want to start with the things that are factually known about this as much as we can factually know about kind of the timeline of what the hell just happened. Because obviously, when news of this dropped, the internet just went poof. It it was like if you dropped an atomic bomb on social media, everybody, everybody is now a member of Conspiracy Twitter. Even normies, like normies joined conspiracy Twitter yesterday. And it's entirely understandable because, of course, Jeffrey Epstein was being held in prison for pedophilia, for various sorts of trafficking crimes, sex trafficking. And it's all been linked to supposedly very high placed people in the government, in the deep state, in just everywhere, everybody everybody has all these different thoughts and ideas about who is and is not going to be, like, implicated in this whole thing. So, obviously, yeah, it just, it was, it was so nuts yesterday. And some people were doing it jokingly, some people half-jokingly, some people dead serious. Like, we had Clinton body count hashtag trending, we had Trump body count hashtag trending. I saw people blame it on the Russians, I saw people blame it on the Jews. I was just like, wow, I have not seen that many conspiracy theories show up that quick before. And of course the Clinton one, that's something that's been around for, God, at least 20 years, and obviously it's the first place everybody went, but... I want to start with trying to establish a timeline as much as a timeline can be established right now. So it was initially reported when all this broke that he had committed suicide while he was on suicide watch. He was not at the time of his death on suicide watch. What ended up happening is about three weeks ago, Epstein did have an attempted suicide. And then after that, he was put on suicide watch. And he was on it for six days and then off of it for 12 days before he eventually did kill himself. How Suicide Watch works in federal prison is obviously once you either attempt suicide or somebody thinks that you are serious enough about attempting suicide that it is worth putting you on Suicide Watch, you are put on Suicide Watch. You are moved from either whether you're in general population, you're in kind of like halfway, which is not general pop, but it's not full solitary either, which is where Epstein was, or you're in solitary, wherever you happen to be, you're put into this other cell. And obviously you're in there by yourself and there's nothing in the cell. Like there's no bed sheets. There's no, you don't have shoelaces. You don't have like anything that you could possibly use to harm yourself is completely stripped out of that cell. And you are under 24 hour surveillance. Like every single second, somebody has eyes on you. So you're put into that situation. And the only way you get taken out of Suicide Watch is by somebody signing off on it. Per the Federal Bureau of Prisons guidelines, once an inmate has been placed on watch, the watch may not be terminated under any circumstances without the program coordinator or designee performing a face-to-face evaluation. So basically what that means is in every prison, there is like a head psychologist, there is a psychology department, and for somebody to be taken off of suicide watch, somebody has to do a a face-to-face evaluation with that person, determine that they are no longer a threat to themselves, and then sign them out of suicide watch. And then there's a post report that you're supposed to do after that. So how that happened for Epstein, we don't know yet. Like I'm don't know if that post report will ever be made public. Hopefully, maybe, but obviously he was in Suicide Watch. Somebody determined that it would be okay to move him out of Suicide Watch. I, as to how or why that decision was made, I don't know yet. 
Nobody knows yet, but that seems to be, factually speaking, what happened to lead to this particular situation. So I did want to emphasize that he was not on suicide watch when he did kill himself. He was back in his old cell where he was by himself, but it's not solitary. Like he just, he has his own cell and obviously he's being kept segregated from the general population for obvious reasons. And it's, uh, there's been a lot of questions about how the hell could this possibly have happened? And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute because I have my own thoughts slash theories and everybody has a theory. Now, every fucking buddy has a theory. People who never thought about this shit before in their life have a theory about how Jeffrey Epstein ended up dead before his trial. But I will say that I did not see a single person be surprised that he did not make it to trial. Like, I think it would have been more surprising to everybody if he would have made it through the trial alive. So I think that kind of says something about where we're at as a society and especially viewing these sorts of high profile cases like this and the the kind of cynicism and it's it's earned cynicism. I'm not saying anybody was wrong for assuming this. Like I did too. Like I wasn't surprised when I saw that he was dead. Like I was kind of like, well, no shit. Like there's everybody was kind of of the opinion that like there's no way this dude is making it through this trial alive. Like he's going to end up dead somehow or another. So that's that was kind of interesting and funny in a way and i mean there there is a bit of gallows humor about that pun intended but it it does speak to kind of a distrust that we have with our current criminal justice system and like i said it's well earned it is well earned like there's i i fault nobody for looking cynically at our criminal justice system. In fact, I wish more people would look at our criminal justice cynically. I hope more people look at this case and are like, you know what? This is kind of fucked up. Maybe we should start paying a little more attention to how fucked up this really is. But for what it's worth, moving back to the facts in evidence, um, from everything I've seen, when Attorney General Barr found out that Epstein was dead, he was livid. And as well as he should be. I mean, if if that happens, like, this dude's in federal custody, somebody's supposed to be keeping an eye on him. Like, if I was him, and, and this was like, I have this case, and this is a case that's being pursued, and all of a sudden, this guy ends up dead in federal custody, like, if I was the Attorney General, I would be fucking livid too. But... Off the back of that, um, both the Department of Justice and the FBI have said they're opening investigations into Epstein's death. And the Southern District of New York, who is bringing the case against Epstein, have said that although obviously the criminal charges can no longer continue because Epstein's dead, their investigation is still ongoing and still continuing. And that if anybody else is implicated in this, they will be prosecuted too. And an interesting side note that I saw somebody mention online and I'm pretty sure this is legally true. Um, when Southern District did arrest Epstein, they did get search warrants for his house. And so now, basically anything that is found from any of those search warrants, they had they searched his New York home. I think they also got warrants for his Florida home. I don't think they got warrants for the island. But now that Epstein is dead, he would have been the only person who could have contested anything from those warrants coming out either in court or in public. So now that he's dead, basically everything that they found in those warrants is fair game. And from what I've heard and from things I've seen online, there was child porn found in the New York home. So any information, any evidence, any anything that they got from those warrants is now absolutely de facto entered into evidence. So that may end up fucking over some people depending on what was found in those searches. So just as a side note there, but here's, here is my thoughts and kind of my theory. And I will start out and preface this by saying, we're probably never really going to know what happened. Like this is going to be, this is going to be our new Seth Rich, which I think actually Seth Rich's, the story was debunked, but this will be our new Vince Foster. This will be our new Clinton conspiracy or Trump conspiracy or Russia conspiracy or Jew con conspiracy, depending on where you particularly are on the political spectrum. <laughs> but just, this is just nuts. It's been wild to see people just like 
grabbed this story and just like grafted onto their already like preconceived notions of who does what and who's responsible for all of the bad things in the world. Like it was, I, I really wasn't expecting the Russian or the Jew one. Like I understood the Clinton one and the Trump one, but there, there, some of those just kind of came out of left field that I was like, oh my God, really? You, oh, wow. I learned some things, but here's my thing. It could have been foul play. It could have been the Clintons. It could have been Trump. It could have been anybody. But here's another thing that it could have been that a lot of people are discounting as completely out of hand because it sounds completely far-fetched and just beyond the realm of belief. And that is that this could have happened exactly the way they said it happened. Like, people think that there's no way that Epstein could have killed himself in federal custody. To think that you would have to ignore the realities of life in prison and life in federal custody and ignore the fact that there is precedent for people committing suicides in prison, for people getting beat up in prison, people getting killed in prison, people getting raped in prison, and all these things, theoretically speaking, nobody should be able to do in prison. Like, theoretically speaking, prison should be the safest place on earth because you have all of these guards around, you're under surveillance all the time, and so nobody should be able to pull any kind of bullshit in prison, but we all know people pull bullshit in prison. So, I think that... I think maybe it was made a little clear to Epstein that, like, listen, if we take you off suicide watch and we put you back in your cell and you do whatever you do, well, ain't nobody gonna miss you. And I'm sure there's plenty of people in that prison who basically shrugged their shoulders and were like, well, fuck him. He deserved it. And so the the idea that this couldn't have happened and that he should have had eyes on him 24-7. Yeah, a high-profile prisoner like that, yeah, probably should have been under 24-hour surveillance, but there are legal issues surrounding that. And there's also the ethical and moral issues of people basically turning their backs on certain inmates because of whatever reason. Obviously, I'm sure Jeffrey Epstein had no fucking friends in there. And it's it's entirely possible that he was allowed out of suicide watch and the general distinction was just, well, if he dies, he dies. Which is not to say that that is any better than any other conspiracy because it's still people deciding that it would be okay for him to die. Like people just being like, well, if he dies, he dies, who gives a shit? Which is still, it's still kind of killing somebody. Like, while you're not actually, like, tying the bedsheet around the man's throat, if you take somebody who's suicidal and just, like, plop them down in a cell and there's nobody else in the cell and there's nobody watching and, hey, there's a bedsheet here, well, I mean, you're kind of complicit in the killing of him. So, again, it's people want to think that it's completely beyond the realm of possibility that there couldn't be anything other than some wild conspiracy. Like, no, it could have gone down exactly that way. And yes, there are, there, there are cases of that happening. And so it's to me entirely within the realm of possibility that he was just allowed to kill himself. And that, and, and that, that's not something that really should be discounted when we're talking about this. And I know I like conspiracy theories too. It's fun. It was a lot of fun yesterday. Like Twitter actually like united over something. Like everybody was kind of like in agreement that like, oh my God, conspiracy theories. Woo. And it, it, it was fun. But I do think that there were a lot of discussions brought up yesterday about how we do treat prisoners and about how things like this do happen in prison and about how it is entirely possible and it has happened before that guards just look the other way and let people commit suicide or just kind of encourage people to commit suicide or even if it doesn't go that far, like guards just turning their backs and letting somebody get beat up. Or I, I, an example I saw somebody bring up was Whitey Bulger, which if you've ever seen the movie Departed, you know his story. But basically how he ended up dying was he was just mysteriously left alone in a room with two guys who had beef with him and they beat him to death. Like, this shit happens. 
it's not outside the realm of possibility. And that, again, was another very high-profile prisoner who was about to be transferred to another prison in a couple of days. But all of a sudden, mysteriously, he was just in this room with these two guys and, whoops, they beat him to death. Huh, what are the odds? Like, you know, like, this this is... There's, there's a lot of fucked up shit that happens in prison. That's all I'm saying. And that this could be just another one of those examples of fucked up shit happening in prison. Or maybe Hillary did kill him. Or maybe Trump killed him. Or maybe the Russians. Or maybe the Jews. Or who the hell knows. But anyway, he is dead now. Or And, and that's actually another conspiracy theory. That he's not dead. That he's off, like, in, in like... Wit sex somewhere getting plastic surgery and is about to drop dime on all of these powerful people. That's a theory too, is that he's not even dead. That like, this is just all a staged hoax and that in, I guess, six months or something, he's going to magically reappear. And I don't, like I said, it's, it's nuts. Everybody, everybody has a theory and it's, it's, it's okay. You can have theories. It's super fun, but just don't discount the fact that this could have actually gone down the way that they said it did. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because I think we're done discussing news for the week. Like, I, I there, please don't let any more news happen. Like, this has already been enough for one week. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. And as always, if you did make it this far, thank you. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care, and until next time.